welcome back, Alex. It's great to see you again. We're going to talk about a little bit more of a uh, rough, rough, uh, you know, unhappy topic, uh, given what's going on in, in Russia and Ukraine. And uh, one thing that's important to note is, you know, we just talked to Alex, who was a former Hulu executive about getting a show on Hulu. But what we didn't mention in the prior episode is that Alex grew up in, uh, back then, I guess it was called the Ukraine. Now it's just the country of Ukraine. No, no, no. It was never called the Ukraine. Everyone who calls it the Ukraine is wrong. All of you were wrong. It was never called the Ukraine. Is this, is this a Ukraine. Mandela? I correct this people. Mandela? That's is the one thing I correct thing? people all the time. I, well, uh, the it's, in the U.S., we used to call it the Ukraine. Believe it I think or not. it was wrong. I think it was it was always wrong. <laughs> well, are you, are you saying from like Russia's perspective, it was called Ukraine or? Well, it, the, 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 it, I, that's fine. I talk to my kids about this all the time, which is, yeah. you know, how do you how do you uh, uh, name things where in their native language it's a whole other thing, right? So like yeah. like Rome, it's Roma, right? In Italian, you know what? You know where do these names come from, and kind of how does it work? So um, uh, Ukraine, uh, it, it there was the, there is no there is no um, the in the Russian language. But the Ukraine, I think, was just something that somebody started doing at some point. But it was never it was never correct, going all the way back to when it was still the Soviet Union, which th th there is a the there. Okay. All right. So so in the U.S., we we basically just had it wrong. It's not like I'm <laughs> misremembering. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but now we call it. It's funny. I was I was born I was born in the Soviet Union. I was a I was a citizen of the Soviet Union. I left in December on December second of nineteen ninety one is when I left the Soviet Union uh, and, and arrived in uh, JFK and then Boston was where the family sort of ended up. But what's interesting is literally the night we left was the night that Ukraine became an independent uh, country of its own. And um, as a result, we had our Soviet passports and the Soviet Union has essentially dissolved within uh, some number of weeks or months uh, after that. And so for approximately nine years until it became a US citizen in 19, um, 98, 1990, yeah, so maybe so less seven years, I was actually a citizen of no country uh, because I didn't become a Ukrainian citizen because I didn't want to serve in the military. I go through that whole process and we came to the US as refugees. Um, and so like on my college applications, I had to write, uh, uh, you know, just blank for citizenship. Did that, I mean, did, what kind of questions does that raise? Did, like the colleges reach back out to you and say, you need to- deliver? No, but, but you know, you and I talked about racism a little bit uh, before, and obviously I'm a white person, uh, and so racism in this country is kind of a strange thing to talk about as a white person. But growing up in the Soviet Union, I was a Jew and, and Jews were um, kind of at, at the lowest rank of-, of, of, uh, of Well, of, uh, the history of pogroms, right? Yeah, I mean, it, and so, and Jews were ethnic, right? So, so in the Soviet Union, I was ethnic. Uh, obviously here, that's kind of a funny thing to, to think about, but, in the so but, but there were not, uh, obviously there's no uh, black people uh, or very few um, uh, in the Soviet Union and, and uh, very few Asians. Um, and so the Jews were kind of the, the ethnic group that, you know, so, and, and it was written in, in your passport, like it said Jew in your passport. So, so uh, you know, my uncle didn't get into like the MIT of the Soviet Union because there was a quota, uh, no more than 2% Jews, um, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but, um, uh, but, but, but in, this, in the U.S., I'm just a white guy, right? And, and so uh, in the U.S., uh, none, of this, uh, none of this ever affected me. And initially, I spoke with a very strong accent, but eventually, because I was still, you know, young, I, 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 I you know, I ended up uh, picking up English and all that stuff. And you were 12 years old when you, when you came over. Right? Yeah, a little over 12 years old. Um, but I interviewed actually with this, uh, if you've ever been to Boston, uh, Boston has this, uh, 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 a big park in the center, you know, similar to Central Park, but it's, but it's smaller. It's called Boston Common. And there are these swan boats. So there are these beautiful boats that go around. And usually young kids like high school age are the ones who kind of, you know, they, they pedal uh, the swan boats. And so uh, the, the, the person who owned that was a friend of mine, a classmate of mine, grandfather. He didn't work there anymore, but he owned the, the, the place. And so I went to interview with the manager and literally all my friends got the job there. I did not because I had a green card and he was like anti-foreigner guy. And so he was like, because I was not a US citizen, a citizen, he was like, oh, I'm not hiring any illegals uh, on this team. So that was, the, that was the way in which my lack of citizenship affected me. Okay, so, so you come over from Ukraine. Tell me a little bit about at least at the time, right? What the what the sentiment was among Ukraine? I did not think of Ukraine like we did not think of it as a separate thing back then. It was you know part of it is because I grew up in Kiev, the capital, 
uh, now it's 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 uh, in Ukrainian it's it's uh, Kyiv, but Americans pronounce it Kyiv. Um, and so Ky in Ky but I'm going to keep saying Kyiv because that's what I that's how I grew up speaking. So we all spoke Russian. Uh, we had to learn Ukrainian in school, and Ukrainian and Russian are kind of similar to maybe Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, in that there are you know, languages where you generally will understand the other, even if you don't fully speak it. So I don't speak any Ukrainian anymore, although I did when I was a kid, but I can still understand it. So last time I was in Ukraine was um, maybe eight or so years ago, uh, eight or nine years ago. And uh, even though everything was in Ukrainian, I could understand it completely. And then what I would speak in Russian, everybody could understand me. So, but when I was growing up, it was just the Soviet Union. And so um, when you would go to places like Latvia, uh, those had a, a much, a very strong sense of identity uh, because there was a, a real recency to when uh, the Soviet Union had sort of occupied it and took over Latvia. Uh, and when you go to a place like Kazakhstan- 1940 or 1940? Right around World War II, exactly, during World War II. Yeah. Exactly, and then uh, just, you know, essentially just before, yeah. and, then, uh, and then when you go to a place like Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, because of the ethnic uh, uh, nature of, of, of the people there, or even Armenia or Georgia, uh, there was also a stronger sense of identity. In Ukraine, there wasn't as strong a sense of identity uh, when I was growing up, uh, especially in Kiev, uh, which is a little different from places like Lviv, which are closer to Poland and they had a kind of a stronger uh, national identity. Um, so, so it was and, and it was a higher proportion of uh, ethnic Russians in the in the area that you grew up is what I'm. Whether they're eth yes ethnic Russians, but more importantly, just Russian speakers. So native Russian speakers who speak Russian um, in school, at home, at work, and that's just their language. And Ukrainian is a language they have to learn rather than Ukrainian is their native language. Okay. All right. So, so when you were there, the sentiment, um, at least the part you were on, there was really not that much of a separation. It was kind of... At the time, it wasn't, again, I was still a kid, but it wasn't as much of a thing as, the, as just the, the downfall of the Soviet Union. So, you know, the biggest, for me, the biggest, most striking memory was when the coup happened in the... Uh, August, I think it was August, uh, sometime in the summer before I left uh, the Soviet Union of 1991, where uh, Gorbachev got overthrown temporarily by uh, by kind of the, the heavies. And uh, that was a very fraught time period where on TV, you know, you were seeing uh, um, uh, Tchaikovsky's ballets, you know, back to back to back to back. And then all of a sudden, somehow the news ended up breaking through because some of the news organizations were, were run by people who were um, uh, who were uh, uh, supporters of the democratic policies and Yeltsin got on the tank. It was a whole, you, you probably remember it well, it, it's a whole thing. And uh, that was extremely memorable. So it wasn't, it was more about that, like that, that big sort of freedom cries and the separation, the, 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 um, the, the separation was much bigger, this feeling of separation, because I was in Latvia at the time on a family vacation. And there, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, later Armenia, Azerbaijan, which were at war with each other. Those, there was a lot of cessation kind of from the Soviet Union uh, elements there. Uh, in Ukraine, it was more sort of tame. But then what ended up happening is that all of the former republics um, ended up uh, separating and over time creating their own uh, strong sense of identity and nationalism. Um, and, and a big part of it was also what Russia became versus what those uh, separate countries became. And, and as you know, they all went in different directions. So Belarus remains a dictatorship run by the same person who's been there uh, since the end of the Soviet Union, uh, whereas uh, Ukraine went in a very uh, different direction. And you said you were there about eight years ago. What, what change did you see compared to your memories as a 12 year old boy kind of leaving? Well, that's the part that that's so you know sad uh, to be frank uh, with you. So I was, uh, and I'll tell you like the full sort of ironic story. So I was in Russia uh, along with a number of uh, executives, uh, uh, Hollywood executives uh, from various uh, media companies uh, in, in the US. And we were there on a fully uh, expense full, uh, paid trip uh, financed by the Russian government, uh, specifically the the Russian uh, uh, Ministry of Culture, and what they were they were they were trying to recruit us. This was just before uh, the the Russian Olympics, and they were recruiting us to try to buy content from Russia and to make stuff in Russia um, uh, pr uh, productions. And I was there with you know well known executives from uh, uh, studios and uh, uh, networks uh, in the U.S. 
Uh, and they really sort of wine and dine us and they had us watch a bunch of movies. They took us to a film festival. And then that was all in Moscow. Uh, and then uh, they were taking the group to St. Petersburg. And I said, listen, whatever that cost is, can you just instead spend it? And, and uh, I'll take the train to Kiev where I'm from and see some of my family and kind of spend a little bit of time there. And at the time, uh, Kiev, uh, uh, Ukraine and Poland were co-hosting the European Cup uh, for soccer, for uh, football, European football. And, and so, you know, it was, there was this incredible celebration, a sense of joy and a sense of positivity uh, in Ukraine as a co-host together with Poland of a very European, uh, of a very European thing. And the other thing is, you know, you take the train from Moscow to St. Petersburg, so, sorry, from Moscow to Kiev, which is an overnight train. It's a, you know, very pleasant experience. You leave at eight o'clock at night, you arrive at eight o'clock in the morning, you sleep on the, on the train. Um, and it was, you know, it was very easy to cross borders and, and, and sort of, you know, go back and forth. And then, and that was essentially the summer before the Olympics. And as you know, right after the Olympics, uh, Russia ended up occupying uh, Crimea and essentially Ukraine and Russia went into war. But I was really excited. You know, I bought my, my daughter who is now 13, but at the time she was three or four, I bought her a t-shirt, you know, of the, of the, of the European cup with like the Polish and, and the Ukrainian flags on it. And I was really excited to bring my kids to visit uh, Ukraine. Uh, and at the time, I just thought it was, you know, it would have been like visiting, you know, Poland and, and, and Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia. It would have been one trip. My wife and I, when we did our honeymoon, we, 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 we took a train from Kiev to Moscow to St. Petersburg. It was, it was really wonderful. So it, it's very dispiriting to have seen, you know, the place where I grew up uh, have been, you know, in a period of either war or some kind of strife over the period of the last decade. It's, uh, it's sad. One quick digression, um, because I'm, I'm curious. So if you left when you were around, you know, 1991, when you were around 12, that probably means you were six or seven when Chernobyl happened. Yeah, 86, exactly. And Chernobyl is, I think, north of, I, I'm used to saying Kiev too, so. About 100 miles from Kiev. Yeah, my apologies to, uh, you know, uh, Ukrainian patriots, but I just, I can't. I say Kiev because that's what I grew up saying. I, so, I grew up saying the same exact thing, right. so it's hard for me to unlearn it, um, but I will maybe at some point. Um, so you were about the same age I was when uh, Three Mile Island happened. When I was, yeah. I, was, I was four, I think I was four years old. I was seven, yeah. And, and that was probably, I mean, I'd have to look at the map, maybe within maybe a hundred miles from where I grew up in yeah. Delaware and that happened in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where my right. grandparents lived. So I can only, like, I don't even remember the experience because it was well-contained and things like that. But Chernobyl, I think was a little bit different. You were a little older. I remember it com very, very, uh, I mean, I'm sure I have false memories, but I remember it. Uh, um, so what ended up happening with, when Chernobyl happened was Nobody knew. So it happened on April 26th of 1986. And uh, we were not, we did not learn about it until the first week of May. So May, maybe 5th or so. And I remember how angry my family was because May 1st uh, is a international workers uh, day. And so there's this big, 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 big celebration uh, in Kiev in the center. All of us went out, you know, celebrated. The winds were blowing towards Kiev and nobody knew. The, the way people found out was because I, I can't remember if it was Sweden or Finland started noticing crazy levels and, uh, and, and ask everybody in Europe, <laughs> ask the Soviet Union, they said, not us, ask everybody in Europe and you went back. And, and by the way, the Chernobyl TV show on HBO, if you haven't seen it, it is absolutely spectacular. One of the greatest television shows um, made. And I really, really did not want to watch it. I was super against watching it. And then I ended up uh, watching it because everybody kept telling me how good it was and uh, it was definitely worth it. And it was extremely accurate. Other than the fact that everyone spoke English, it was one of the most accurate depictions. And so, so we ended up, uh, my family, we ended up basically going to Crimea, ironically, uh, and um, because a grandfather of mine was in the military and he had access to some, you know, some base in Crimea where we could get a place to stay for a few nights. And then we literally went around uh, to try to find a place to stay for the summer, you know, just to rent, like a, the equivalent of Airbnb, but the way you get the room is by just knocking on people's door saying, do you have a room to, to lend? Uh, and um, a lot of people thought we were contagious, you know, like, uh, you know, not unlike HIV in, in the 80s, you know, with, with uh, uh, the, the gay population, they thought that we were somehow gonna, gonna sort of breathe radiation uh, onto them. But that's, so we ended up spending the summer in, 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 in Crimea, which is a little further away, 
Mm-hmm. And then uh, my first grade, uh, I ended up spending the first eight months of first grade in Moscow because uh, an uncle had a friend who had a spare apartment and we were able to stay there in Moscow. So it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was a very, very traumatic experience. And candidly, part of the reason I'm in the United States it is yes, part of it was you know the persecution of Jews. Part of it is the fall falling of the Soviet Union. But the biggest reason was uh, radiation. Really? Yeah, that's that's motivated my family to leave. Yeah. And it's just it, it, you know, so why you know, why did why what what so what was the kind of the straw that broke the camel's back? Like when when did your parents decide? This is this is time to leave. Was there like one event that did that, or is it just they just been trying for? It was, it was a combination of a number of different things. Like we changed my last name, so I had I was born with a different last name, a much more Jewish sounding last name. We changed it because you know I got beat up in school, you know, anti-Semitism type stuff, you know, little kid stuff, um, and uh, uh, the 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 radiation stuff, the falling apart of the Soviet Union, and uh, and then just you know other you know other family members started leaving. And, uh, and so we, you know, we ended up sort of, uh, they were resistant to it, especially, you know, they, they were professionals with jobs and, and an apartment and a place to live. And, and but we, by the way, we moved to the United States, we were on welfare and Medicaid, we had no income. Um, and, uh, and it was a recession. Uh, this was the, this was yeah. the George uh, Bush senior 1991 recession. And so, you know, my mom did some babysitting. Uh, uh, my dad delivered pizza. My, Dad, lift, delivering pizza was a job he could get once once he could get paid. Because when you're on welfare, you can't get a, a you know a paycheck, right? So he was delivering furniture for three bucks an hour, and I would help him, uh, you know, just kind of under the table payment until my mom got a job. Her salary was twenty eight thousand dollars a year. She was a computer programmer, and then my dad could deliver pizza. Eventually, he got a job, you know, and eventually we entered kind of lower middle class. But that took three years, maybe. What did, um, he, what, what did they do when they were in Russia? Like, what were their professions? They're both computer programmers. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, I mean, that could you, I, there's nothing more difficult than to have like a, a, a skill set like that and to have to like humble yourself when you, <laughs> you're surrounded by people. Well, when you were, and there were, you know, my, they were my age now. So I'm in my 40s now, right? They were, they were my oh, age. It's yeah. a significant transition, right? In life, like, you know, you just get yanked out and, and, you know, the world is much more global now back then, you know, none of them have ever left the country, you know, that we're not allowed to travel or anything else. And uh, my dad, my, my mom, my mom spoke a little bit of English because she studied it in high school. My dad didn't speak a word. Yeah. It was massive, massive transition. We had $680 for eight people. So sort of six people that we, you know, is my grandparents, two of my grandparents and my four person family. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, I mean, for me, I was a kid, right? So what the fuck do I know? But it was, it was for them. It's, it was a well, really. You, cer- you certainly experience. weren't spoiled, right? <laughs> you can say that. You can say you kind of, you kind of got where you are. You know, you raised, you, ra- you definitely raised yourself up. All right, we're we have like a very limited amount of time because I want to get to the next topic. So I'm just going to ask you, what's what's your take on what's, um, what is about to happen or what is happening? in russia ukraine right now well listen i'm not so you you have a lot of expertise in kind of military stuff and 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 um and uh you know troop movements and all that stuff and i have no i have no uh, I, have, I don't have anywhere anywhere near deep enough knowledge to express a strong point of view on that i think that um the, the where i do have some you know understanding is kind of how the people think and how they're motivated and i think that um I think that it's difficult for Americans to understand the Russian people um, uh, who are, you know, who are kind of a long suffering people that have suffered uh, over a period of multiple centuries. And, uh, and there is a, uh, there's, there's probably more in common between the Russian person and the Chinese person than there is between a Russian person and uh, quote, quote unquote, Western, you know, uh, Max Weber uh, uh, capitalist uh, type person um, in that there is this sense of, um, of the greater good. And, and there is this perception of Russia as a world power, which has had uh, elements of kind of being a second class citizen uh, until Peter the Great came uh, and you know propelled it to be more of a first class citizen. And the way that Russia participated in World War I, World War II, where World War II, you know, the Soviet, the Russian people really believed that that it was the Soviet Union that won World War II, the same way that Americans believe that it was America who won. No, World no, War II. I'll, I'll fully concede they fought. They faced seventy-five to eighty percent of the Wehrmacht. 
well, they certainly were the ones who had the most people die, right? And my, my, my grandfather, both my grandfathers were involved. One was younger, but the other one was, uh, was in the military, in the, in the Soviet army. And so, 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 so there's this greater kind of, you know, who are we as part of the overall world order? And yes, we might be dying uh, en masse. And yes, we might not be doing as well as others, but us being perceived as kind of important global citizens is a big deal. And, uh, and Putin, I think what he's done really, really well is he has inspired a sense of unity and a sense of, of kind of strongman power amongst the Russian people. And when they feel threatened as a people, they will act in a way that we as Americans might perceive as being against their self-interest. Um, and I think it's important to understand um, that part of it. Um, there is, I'm not going to wade into the historical kind of the historical uh, unity or lack thereof between Ukraine and Russia. It goes all the way back uh, to you know yeah, maybe maybe two millennia really. Like you know the 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 history there. Uh, it's very complicated. There's a lot there. Um, it's not my place to kind of get into it. What I can say is that that th that it is extremely sad that the Ukrainian people and the Russian people feel. Uh, and I, by, by the way, I don't think that they do. Uh, the regular people. But that, but that they kind of are forced to see each other as uh, opponents or as foes or as enemies because they are extremely close. You know, very, very akin to um, to um, the closeness between um, uh, various other neighboring countries that we're kind of all familiar with, um, and we've seen similar things in, in let's say, Central America. Uh, where you know some neighboring countries who speak the same language and who are essentially well, the same let, people let, 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 tend let me, to sort of step on each other's toes. Let me personalize this a little bit for, for myself. I mean, would you say it's kind of akin to as you as you talk about like kind of Central American countries, or uh, the the difference between kind of the the English and the Irish, as an example? No, I don't think that there's the same level of strife as the English and the Irish have had, because that there's a, there's a religious component there, right, between yep. Catholics and, and Protestants, um, as as well as also like a sense of oppression and a sense of of like, you know, a lot has a lot happened during the conflict uh, between the English and the Irish. Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia has not had a history of conflict like that. The conflict that happened with Crimea was was reasonably manufactured, right? It it didn't really exist, so there's not that like in their bones, they fucking hate each other kind of thing. Well, there's, there's, there's some of that with Polish people uh, and, and, and the Soviet Union, as well as with Hungarians and, you know, sort of- What, 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 what about the hollow doom? I, I'm gonna screw it up, but the hollow dome, or I, I totally mispronounced it. Like that, that to me, that's a, it's similar to kind of the, or an analog, not exact, but an analog to the Irish, to the <laughs> Irish potato famine. Lots of terrible shit happened during, during Stalin's uh, era. And, oh, and, and so people Stalin. blame Stalin for that. They don't blame Russian people for that. That's a Stalin thing. Uh, I, I, again, I, I just, what, I mean, what the hell do I know? I left when I was 12 and I was there, you know, as a visitor. Uh, so I was almost like a well-informed tourist than I was kind of a, a person there. But I, I, my perception is that, is that these are people who think of themselves as cousins. And, um, then again, I mean, we've seen some horrific conflict in in in, in Kosovo and and in uh, Rwanda and other places where neighbors kind of turn against each other. But even there, there was a religious and a and an ethnic strife, and I don't think it's the same kind of strife. Ukrainians and Russians don't have the same ethnic history of hostility that 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 other examples do. So I again, that's my point of view. I may be off. I may be you know I haven't been there in a long time, but I'm I'm very saddened by kind of some of what's going on and. Um, I, I tend to be an, I'm an entrepreneur, so I, I tend to think in a glass half full manner, uh, but I really, really hope that there's some resolution that isn't, that doesn't cost a ton of lives out there. Yeah, I, I'm not super optimistic. I think um, they're, they're running some exercises in um, Belarus, which are supposed to end February 20th. Which, which is the end of the Olympics. Which conveniently dovetails at the, the end of the Olympics. Um, I think, again, I, I, this, is, this, this kind of makes the, the analysis is not super deep, but there's an old maxim, right? You can do anything with bayonets, but sit on them. And I think this is, this is one of those situations. You don't, I remember back having lived through the Iraq war, not, having been over there, but the run up to it and watching the dip diplomacy and things like that. And I remember being 
stationed at the National Training Center back in October 2002. And I knew we were going to war. Like I was watching all this. Well, the flip side of that, again, not to be a glass half full person, but my grandfather who, who passed away at the age of 95, um, he was born in 1918. So he would have been 104 now, but he, he, um, he was in the, in the Soviet military and he was, he was, uh, in the Katusha division, which is, which is the, the, the yeah. and so what that meant is that he was involved, uh, peripherally in the, in the nuclear stuff back in the, in the sixties. And, um, he was, you know, he had some, uh, um, you know, distant, uh, 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 involvement in, uh, uh, in the Bay of Pigs uh, uh, situation. And th that's an example, you know, what happened between Cuba and, uh, and JFK's uh, the United States was an example of how things actually worked out okay, right? Th that could have been a nuclear war and it didn't happen. And those were arguably uh, more trigger happy people on both sides uh, than are now. So that's, the, that's kind of an example of, that I, but, but I think you would push back and say, that's one of the few examples of where a troop uh, where troop aggressions didn't work, it turned out into a hor horrific uh, world war. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'm, and, I, and to be clear, I'm not I'm not suggesting that there'll be a world war. What I'm suggesting is that I think it's 90, 98 percent that there'll be a limited incursion into Ukraine um, to affect an outcome or leadership change at the governmental level. It's effectively um, so it's effective to seizing territory and then using it as a as put using it as a gun or or as leverage. Well, listen, that that feels again. I don't know. Uh, that feels likely to me based on what I'm seeing and reading. My hope is that it doesn't result in you know a hundreds, uh, uh, tens of thousands of lives. Uh, 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 you know, I, 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 if that happens, I really hope that it's surgical and it doesn't result in in a lot of innocent lives being lost. Or, I mean, I, the term innocent lives is kind of like people in the military innocent too. <laughs> they just happen to to sort of sign up for a bigger risk. If I've observed Putin in the past, I would imagine you would see something that would be bloodier than his normal campaigns, but you would see some, something akin to like a um, deception operation like Domino, right? So like the way Putin operates is he might bribe a few battlefield commanders here, battlefield commanders there. The people on the front who haven't necessarily been moving a lot, I would, I would be shocked if the Russian military didn't have those locations dialed in. So you probably have horrific casualties in the first few days, at least on the front lines. And then you'd see things kind of roll like dominoes in terms of like, oh, this town suddenly just, um, you know, they drove past it and circled it, et cetera, and then moved on, uh, much like you saw in Crimea. Like it was, you barely fired a shot in Crimea. Well, there, there was no, there were virtually no casualties, right? In Crimea. Well, listen, I hope you're wrong. I hope there's, there's, I hope it doesn't happen. I hope there's no casualties. So I'm, I guess I'm hoping for the 2%, but uh We'll no, I, look, I could be completely wrong, right? I'm just taking the data that I'm seeing and and right. applying. I, I'm, you know, I'm. To me, every, you know, every every hammer, you know, every whatever, you know, everything looks like a nail, right? Because I have that. Right, because you're the hammer, right? I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, it was a pleasure talking to you about this. And uh, join us for the next uh, stage. We're going to talk about a little bit about Popin, and uh, for writers in particular, there's going to be a really unique discussion that you should definitely tune in for. So we'll join us for the next show um, tomorrow. Talk Sounds to good. Bye.